Okay, let's get started. So welcome everyone to um, session 4A of the Zero Emissions Solutions Conference. Um, and our session today is Net Zero Cities of the Future. Uh, my name is Kendra Wozluck and I am the Sustainable Development Planner at Monash University in uh, Melbourne, Australia. Um, and I work in the Buildings and Property Division of the University. Um, and I am responsible for the university's operational sustainability strategy um, and also Capital Works um, planning and projects to deliver on our, both our net zero emissions goals, but also our general sustainability goals around energy, water, waste, and the like. Um, so I have the honor today of chairing the session. Um, so first I wanted to start off with um, an acknowledgement of country. Um, and given that we're meeting virtually, um, and I'll go with the um, sort of one for across all of Australia. So in the spirit of recon reconciliation, um, we all wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and their connections to the land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today. So myself personally, I live this is Melbourne in a little picture here. I live about 16 kilometers southeast of Melbourne in a suburb called Sandringham. So I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which I'm currently sitting, which is the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation. I'm also on this bigger map, lucky to sit smack bang in the middle of a 17, 17 kilometer section of coastline, basically where I have the opportunity to extend my learning of the local indigenous history. Um, so the trail has lots of contemporary indigenous artwork um, and lots of stories based on the natural environment. And when I was looking up today for images, actually in the guidebook, there's a picture of the, um, it's called the Bunurong landscape, which is the coastline. And that's actually at the end of my street. So that was kind of very cool to see. Um, to give you some context, our other speakers today. Um, so we have Anna and Scott who are in the greater Melbourne region with me as well. Um, and then we have Rajan, who's in Ahmedabad, which is in Western Indi India. And when I was looking it up, I realized and found out it is one of the largest cities in India. And we also want to wish him a very happy Diwali. Um, and then Ryan is in London in the UK, even though he kind of looks like he's straddling Norway, but it's such a tiny country, I had to squish him in there. Um, so to give you an overview of today's session, it's split up between the um, speakers giving a presentation and then a panel Q&A. Um, so we're going to have Anna, who's from NG, talk about big picture net zero sort of some scene setting. What is net zero? Why it's important? How do we take the journey to achieve net zero cities and precincts? And then she's going to talk about some case studies. Scott's going to take a bit of a more deeper dive and talk about specifically the Monash University Clayton campus and technology precinct and talk about things we've tested today, a bit of our testing and learning around energy efficiency, building optimization, electrification and precinct scale microgrids. Rajan is going to go even deeper and talk about how technology can assist cities to achieve net zero um, and how it can help governments make more informed decisions around policies and programs. Rajan's gonna focus more on the, the people side and communities of cities because um, having going towards a net zero city will have ramifications on the everyday life of the community. Um, so he's gonna be talking about different governance approaches to basically um, help engage communities in local climate policy and politics and utilizing Manchester city as a case study. First off, we wanted to start with some audience participation. Um, so if you're not familiar with it, we're gonna use a service called Kahoot. So if you on your phone or in another window in your browser could go to, um, Oh, I haven't shared my screen. Oh, I've been doing all these slides and you can't see my screen. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'll go back and show you what you missed. Hang on. Uh, so this was a picture of the coastline. This is the Burnerong landscape. Um, here's where we're in Melbourne. Here's where everybody is in the world. Um, that's our speakers. And now we've got audience participation. Thanks for that. Um, so if you go to kahoot.it, um, it will ask you if you have the app, it'll ask you to put in a pin number, which I'm going to give you in a second. Um, and what, I've got about six questions and it's really so we can learn a little bit more about yourselves. Um, 
So you get about 30 seconds to answer each question. Most of them are free text that you just type in. You get about 20 characters. Um, and then there's a couple of random trivia questions I threw in there just to capture your attention. So Scott and Anna and Ryan, can you, can you guys give me a thumbs up that you can see the Kahoot screen? Awesome, thank you. Here we go, first, Marius, first one on the screen, well done. Yeah, don't be shy, get in there, we've got 10. It's gotta be at least 30 or 40 of you out there. So the pin, if you, you don't see it, it's up there at the top. It's the 6394694. I'll give it another 30 seconds to see if we get anyone else. You can, if you join late or you're a bit, a bit behind, you can join at any time. The pin number will stay up. One more, if I get 20, all right, I feel like I have critical mass with 20, let's go. So this first one I think is a free text question. We just want to know, we've told you where we're from. We would really like to know where you're joining us from. So if you type your answer of what country you're joining us from. And if you're wondering why the globe's upside down, it's because I'm in Australia and that's our view of the world. Oh yeah, and if you can't um, get in, you can feel free to type in the chat box as well. There we go, we have quite a Netherlands, Germany, India, Can oh, Canadians, lots of Australians, awesome. So next question, this is a quiz question. So in what city is COP26 being held? So anybody should be able to pick the color. Eight seconds left. Let's go. Oh, Madrid. And Madrid was uh, last year, I think, the last one. All right, so I'm not sure who Peter V is, but you're in the lead. Uh, another word cloud. So we'd also like to know, you've told us what country you're in. We'd really like to know what city you're in in that country. I'm biased because I'm in Melbourne, so I got to put a Melbourne picture. Oh, we've got a few people in Glasgow. Excellent. Which is out okay. there. One of UK. Melbourne. Let's be the most people in Melbourne. We're skewing it a little bit, I think, as the um, speakers. Brilliant. Three more to go, quiz question. So this is for this, uh, this one. What is the theme of this year's Zero Emission Solutions Conference? This might be a trippy one. Uh, so it is the one. So it's key climate solutions for a decade of action. And I wanted to put that in there just to reiterate that the presentations today are going to be and the conference is about solutions, not necessarily about having all the answers, but it's about solutions that have been tried in passing on those learnings. Um, 
can't remember where I got the red one from, the net zero cities of the future, that's this current session and great to the two people who are looking forward to it, even though you don't know the theme, awesome. Word cloud, um, we're keen to know what sector you come from. So which sector do you work or study in? Got some Honolulu Madrid. I'd like to be in Honolulu right now. In the chat, we've got national government, the water sector. City Leisure, University Government. I'm keen to know what the big blue one's going to be. Education, lots of academics. Awesome. We've got recycling buildings, someone doing their PhD, congratulations, climate philanthropy, brilliant. Last question, uh, two more, next one's trivia, I believe, yep. What is the literal translation of Glasgow from Gaelic? Good. Dear Green Place. So there is actually something in Glasgow called the Squinty Bridge. It's actually a bridge, but the locals nickname it Squinty Bridge. Uh, well done. Last one. Word cloud and I don't remember what I asked. Oh, do you have an example of what you think is the of a good net zero city? Is there one out there already? Really keen to see what None. Yeah, to Toronto. Oh, zero come zero waste per ton. Monash <laughs> microgrid. <laughs> Singapore. How oh, interesting. Clayton. No. Crystal. Right. Well, thank you everyone for um, playing along. We do have a podium. So, in the trivia, we can see who in the trivia. So, Nat L was third on the trivia questions. L was second. And who was first? Sam. Well done. Close that one. Thank you for playing along. Hopefully that was a bit of fun to start you off. Um, so we're going to move straight now into our speakers' presentations. So we're going to start with Anna Cloonan. Um, so Anna has 20 years of experience as an engineer, project manager, and business leader. Um, in the resources and energy sector. She's a background in process engineering um, and she's had technical contribution to projects for over 15 years in engineering and project delivery. Um, she's brought this to her current role um, with the NG Net Zero Solutions team um, and they're focused on integrating infrastructure services and technology to deliver net zero precincts across Australia. I will stop sharing and hand over to Anna. Thanks, Kendra, and thank you, everybody, for having me. Um, it's lovely to speak to you all today, um, and I guess I'd like to start first by acknowledging uh, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations whose land I speak to you from today. Um, also in Melbourne for, with, uh, with Kendra, um, but just from a slightly different, uh, different place in the city. Um, so super excited to be talking to you about net zero cities of the future and thought we'd jump straight in with why the focus on net zero. Um, for cities? Uh, and the answer is quite simple. Um, it is um, cities occupy, if you, if you look at the stats up on your screen, they we occupy the, the smallest amount of space in the globe, um, but consume the highest amount of energy. And of course, uh, um, uh, perpetrate, perpetrators of the, the, the most greenhouse gas emissions globally. So what I like to say is if we are going to wage a war on climate change, then cities are our battleground. Uh, and this is why the focus so much on, on net zero cities. And of course, um, that is only going to in increase over time. 
Uh, we currently have 50% um, of the globe living in cities today, and we know that is going to increase to 70 or 75% by the year 2050. And, and that alone is putting enormous strain on our cities today, as they exist today, as we, as we use and interact with our cities today, um, but also on the infrastructure um, that our cities um, bear to, to house us, um, to, to feed us energy. Um, when we think about a sustainable city, we think about waste, water and energy. Um, but, but at NG, I guess we're, our focus is on energy. And, and we believe that any energy is at the heart of the transition um, as we move um, to these to these mega cities, if you like, that that are being created across the globe. Um, when we think about the city of a future, um, a net zero city isn't just about energy. Um, we do need to think about sustainability as a whole. So again, water and waste also. Um, contribute a, a huge amount to this idea of a net zero city of the future. Um, but if we also think about, you know, previous trends, um, smart cities for the last two decades, smart cities have been a huge trend uh, globally. And we've seen countries like China and India build entire cities from scratch um, um, in, in this smart, technically um, capable way. Um, and I guess what we're seeing, um, the trends that are being, um, being shown over the last um, number of years is that while smart cities are amazing, um, they are heavily technology focused and they're missing one crucial aspect. And that aspect is the interaction with humans. So the interaction between technology and, and humans and, and what we're starting to see the trends for, for the future is what we call a, a linking city. So a city that is not just about smart technology, um, but it also has this, this idea of human interactivity um, at, at the heart of it. So they need to be sustainable. And I will talk about the, the energy side of that um, as we move forward. Um, they need to be smart, they need to be technology driven, um, but they need to be inclusive. So part of the issue with, with smart cities of, of the past is that, you know, they have been quite exclusive when we think about um, different parts of society, you know, disadvantaged um, parts of society that potentially don't have access to technology um, or, or green energy or, you know, um, bins to, to, um, to separate their waste. Um, uh, and then the, the part, of tech, uh, part of society that perhaps can access the technology but don't know exactly how to use it. So how do we overcome all of those problems? Uh, and how do we make sure that our cities of the future um, are lovable places? are places that we want to live and work in and be in. How do we make sure that there's great connection between the residents and the occupants of our cities uh, and that the infrastructure and the technology that's provided to run our cities? And so that um, sort of very broadly, I suppose, is, is that challenge that we now face in creating net zero cities um, that, that encompasses so much, much more um, is, is how do we actually do this better in the future? At NG, when we focus on the energy um, aspect of a net zero city, we look at three key areas. The first one, of course, is to optimise the energy that we use today. I think it's no longer um, acceptable um, just to, to use energy like we, like we always have, uh, like it's an endless supply of energy. Um, uh, of something that we, you know, we, we never have to worry about running out of. It's really important that as we transition to this future of renewables, that we're quite conscious about how we use energy when we use it. Um, and there are um, technologies and infrastructures available, um, as many of us know, to help optimise how we use um, our energy and how we use it efficiently. Um, secondly, we, we work to decarbonise the energy source. So we either do that by looking at um, um, on-site renewable generation. Um, and typically, you know, the, the first thing that most people do when they embark on a net zero journey, and certainly in Australia, is that they put some solar on their rooftop. Uh, and we know that in Australia itself, we have the highest penetration of rooftop solar in the world. Um, and it's, it's quite a, a simple and easy and affordable thing to do um, today. But what are the next steps? Part of the challenges with um, with the infrastructure, the energy infrastructure that's already in place is that um, our, our local grids can't cope with that peak that we see in the middle of the day when the sun is shining at its brightest. So how do we overcome that? How do we um, look 
for you know local storage solutions, either batteries and, and thermal storage, et cetera, to help balance that peak load. How do we look at shifting our energy load? It very much ties into how we optimize energy consumption. When do we use our energy throughout the day to help to help manage those peaks? And thirdly, we look at the way we interact with the city, how we often um, one of the key aspects is, is typically mobility. Um, how do we get to and from the city? How do we travel to and from work or to study or to play? And what do we do when we get there? Do we, um, do we have to jump in a car to move around the precinct or can we walk? You know, how do we, how does that work? Um, and how can we better optimize the way that city operates so that we can make more energy efficient choices? Um, for example, and one of the examples I can think of, which is a great example, is actually Monash, Monash's Clayton campus, um, where they've actually um, pedestrianised the entire campus. So once you get there, you may have to get into a car to travel to campus, but once you get there, you're out, you're on foot, and you're able to walk across the campus freely or travel in, you know, scooters and, 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 other, and other things. Um, but it's completely pedestrianised so that there's no risk of, um, of that interaction between humans and cars, which is a really lovely way to get around and enjoy that natural environment. So, of course, you know, all, all of this is, is wonderful, but, but how do we actually get from those three concepts to um, actually delivering a net zero city? Um, and the very first thing that, that we do is to go and seek feedback from the inhabitants, if you like, of the city of all the precincts. So the people that work there, um, the people who run businesses, uh, the people who might study there, go to school there, um, it, it, et cetera. And we seek feedback on how they think the city is operating, um, how, how in love with the city are they, uh, and what are the things that they would need in order to be in love with that city and for it to be that perfect place to live or to play um, or, to, or to study. Um, and then from there, we develop a roadmap. Uh, and when I talk about a roadmap um, for the Australians on the call, I'm not talking about uh, a document that might just talk to ideas. We actually formulate um, a, a plan uh, with specific projects that need to be carried out um, with a timeline and financing options that will help achieve the city or the precinct to achieve its vision, whether that be net zero or climate positive, whatever that, that vision is. Uh, and it's very practical and it looks at the what we believe the, the three different layers of, um, of projects that need to be undertaken in order to achieve net zero. The very fundamental layer is that layer of infrastructure. So what are the physical assets that we need to install um, in the ground, on top of the ground, wherever that, on top of a building, whatever that might be, um, to help um, optimise that energy use and to decarbonise that energy source. So that's the very first fundamental layer. And these are often the projects that take the longest. Of course, infrastructure projects um, need to be very well planned. Uh, they need to be very well engineered. So they, they often take a long, the longest and, and in the roadmap, our roadmaps will define the timelines for, for those to um, be undertaken. Secondly, um, when we look at services, um, so what are the services that we need to provide to the residents of the of the city or the users of the city um, to help that to help them make better choices when it comes to energy? So, for example, um, the next time you go out and buy a car, how do we make sure that um, you have all of the infrastructure and the services available so that you make that decision to buy an electric vehicle and not an ICE vehicle? And finally, the the, the top layer that layer that really provides the integration between everything um, is the digital layer and, and, the, and the, the, um, uh, the, the data that we can collect um, and optimise uh, to help run our city, our buildings um, better uh, and, and more efficiently. If we take a quick look at a couple of case studies, the first one um, is the city of Springfield, which is in Queensland in Australia, just outside of Brisbane. This is a city that we're working with um, over the next 50 years to help them create a net zero city by 2038. Now this city is about 25% of the way through its development. So it has about 45,000 residents today that hope they hope to have that up at around 115,000 by the year 2038, which is also the time that they hope to be net zero energy. Um, this 
is, a, is an interesting city because what we've got here is a partially brownfield city. There is some um, built form in place. There are services, um, train stations, schools, um, hospitals, et cetera, already um, established in the city. But there's also a wealth of greenfield. So what we really have the opportunity to do here is to at the very heart of the, the planning stage is to, is to be able to ensure that the infrastructure required, those pipes that need to go in the ground, the cables that need to go in the ground, they can be there from the beginning. And that's a great advantage to have. Um, but it's also a challenge to make sure that that infrastructure is there in time for um, the buildings to be built. Um, and for the and for the residents uh, to to um, to come to the city. So this is a wonderful example of um, where we've taken um, feedback from the city's residents as as the beginning in through our three hundred and sixty city scan, and then we've built a roadmap. And that roadmap, combined with the feedback that we got from our residents, really showed that we needed to focus on five key areas in the development of the city. Um, and they're listed up there on the screen. The first one being urban. How do we make this a beautiful city, a place where people want to, to live, work and play, um, a place that has open green spaces, places to um, feel that you're, um, while living in a city, still connected to nature. That was a very, very important part of um, the feedback that we got from the residents of Springfield. Um, mobility, how do we, how do, again, how do we make sure that um, the choices that people make um, either to um, purchase an electric vehicle as their, as their next family vehicle um, or to take public transport to, um, to get to and from, from their work. How do we make those decisions easier for people uh, and stop them jumping in their, their ICE vehicles? Buildings, how do we ensure that the building, the built form in that city is built to the highest standard um, so that we're already meeting part of that energy optimization um, goal uh, before, before, we, before we get started? Of course, energy being at the heart of it, how do we uh, how do we generate energy in the city? How do we store it and optimally optimally use it um, across the city over the next twenty years? And then, of course, digital. Um, how do we make sure that that city remains connected and smart? Um, with Monash University, my colleagues on the phone today, Scott and Kendra, we've been working together for a number of years to to look at. Um, Firstly, the wonderful work that Monash have already um, done, which Scott will speak to, to now. Um, and and from, that, from that point, um, how can we help them take the next step to get all the way to net zero? Uh, and we're in the very, very early stages of, of working together to, to help achieve this goal. Um, again, with, with this particular example, we're working in an entirely brownfield um, um, precinct. So how do we best go about that um, that building retrofit that we need to to undertake the um, the uh, the infrastructure that we need to build roads that we'll need to dig up all those sorts of things you know those challenges that we'll have um, how do we do that um, in, in a way that still allows the city and the precinct to operate uh, as we as we work through those challenges but we're in the very early stages we've just finished uh, a roadmap um, that outlines the projects required um, for Monash to achieve that net zero goal. Um, so certainly a very exciting um, uh, project and, and case study to, to work on over the next few years. And I guess um, just, just to end, what I would like to say is that um, while this is a huge challenge um, to take our cities to net zero and to create these linking cities of the future, um, I think, you know, what we can acknowledge is that there are solutions that are um, available today to be implemented today. We know that um, if we needed to, we could reach net zero today. Um, if we could snap our fingers and have that infrastructure in place, we could achieve net zero in our cities today. So this isn't um, an overwhelming um, problem that is, is unachievable. Um, we, have, we have the answers today. And what we know as well, of course, is that the rate of technology and the rate of change um, in, in the digital world is that we will, um, the, the quicker, the, the more we move on through this process, the, the more wonderful solutions that we are going to be uh, developing together as a, as a society um, and that will take us there quicker in the future. But I'd just like to end on, on a note that says, you know, this is an exciting time uh, to be in the world and to be creating these, uh, these cities of the future. Thank you, Kendra.
Thank you, Anna, for that. Um, and thank you for everyone who's putting questions in the chat box. You can also put them in the Q&A. So our next speaker, which Anna's given a good introduction to, is Scott Ferrara. Um, and I work with Scott. Um, Scott is a leader in net zero emissions strategy development um, and implementation with a deep understanding of the opportunities to reduce emissions across the energy, transport, and building sectors. Um, currently at Monash, as Anna's started to introduce, um, we're looking at transitioning our campuses, our Australian operations to net zero emissions by 2030. Um, and the program aims to find translatable solutions to enable broader transition to net zero emissions required under the Paris Agreement. Um, so Scott's going to present on the microgrids and their role in achieving net zero emissions and the learning that we've got from establishing a city scale microgrid at our Clayton campus. So over to you, Scott. Great, thanks, Kendra, and good evening, everybody. Lovely to be here. And just like Anna, uh, a shout out from um, the lands of the Kulin Nation here in, uh, in Melbourne as well. Um, I'll just share my slide deck with you. There we go. Um, so as, as Kendra has spoken to and as Anna's alluded to, I'm going to talk to the experience we've had at Monash University um, on our own net zero journey. Um, and just share some of the um, technologies and approaches we've taken to work towards our net zero target as well. Um, so Monash itself, we committed to net zero emissions um, across our four Australian campuses here. We're an Australian-based university um, with four campuses across Melbourne. Um, we also operate globally as well. Um, and so we committed to getting to net zero back in 2017. Um, and this was for our scope one and two emissions across, across the built environment. So for the um, electricity and gas uh, we utilise to run our campuses. Um, this doesn't cover transport emissions uh, as yet, but I'll touch on that a little bit more uh, lately. And scope three emissions um, are generally out of, out of scope as well. We do have a small uh, vehicle fleet that we do offset currently at the moment. Um, for, for our commitment, uh, the Vice Chancellor at Monash University made a very strong commitment um, in terms of providing the capital budget to deliver on this net zero target as well. So committed $135 million to this transformation. Uh, really, it was to help play a leadership role and demonstrate what is possible and what can be done in this space. But also as a um, research and education institution, um, it was also an opportunity for us to link what we do operationally with our infrastructure, um, with leading research in this space, and then also using those assets to help feed into the education we provide to the leaders of the future as well. So, and it touched on the, the living lab approach that we're taking, um, which, is, which is key to helping um, shape our program, but also focus externally on how do we share the knowledge from that program. Uh, we were lucky enough to win a Momentum for Change Award um, through the UNFCCC uh, back in 2018 for this program and the, the leadership position we'd taken. Um, and so I've been lucky enough to attend a couple of COPs in the past, so disappointed not to be in, in Glasgow this year. Um, so a bit, of, a bit of context for you. Um, I guess as a university, we do run um, cities with our, with our campuses and the scale of Monash's operations are actually Quite large. This is a summary of um, the emissions from our Clayton campus, which was mentioned previously. It's the biggest of our four Australian campuses. Um, Pre-COVID, pre it uh, used to have about 50,000 people a day would attend this campus um, to work, to study, um, to live and enjoy themselves. Um, and it equated to about the fifth large, largest city in Victoria, in, in Australia. So, so it's a big operation. Um, you can see from an emissions point of view from us, um, we have the challenge of both emissions from um, gas and electricity um, that we use to um, heat, cool and run our buildings. Um, we are based in Victoria, which has a really emissions intensive electricity grid and hence why you can see the SKUs um, in, in that. The energy source is probably about a 50-50 split, but the emissions intensity of grid electricity is large in Victoria. Um, as you can see, there's about 80,000 um, 80, tonnes of CO2 emissions per year from this, this campus, and that's about 80% of our emissions we, we 
we, we run at about 100,000 tonnes of CO2 per year as well. So in terms of the transformation that's required um, from the built environment perspective as the owner and operator of cities, we, we see it in four ways and we've borrowed this from our um, colleagues at Climateworks Australia who helped shape decarbonisation pathways and worked with us to develop our strategy as well. So really we're looking um, to the point Anna touched on, um, efficiency. So how can we make sure that the existing building stock we've got um, is retrofitted and is operating as efficiently as possible? But how can we ensure any new builds um, are built to the highest energy performance standards uh, practical as well? Uh, which is a challenge in Australia. Building, building quality and building standards in Australia is far below um, world standards in this space. And uh, many of you based in Europe would be quite shocked to come into an Australian building in winter and appreciate that it's far colder than anything you've ever experienced in Europe. Um, we are also shifting to 100% renewables as well. Um, so need, need to source all our energy supply from, from renewables, both from on-site and off-site sources. Um, and then to one of the questions earlier, um, we're, we're also focusing on electrification, electrification. So that shift away from natural gas so we can run um, our operations off 100% renewable electricity as well. Um, this is largely for our buildings, but also we're, we're focusing on our, our transport system as well. Um, we then also look at storage and the smart energy management aspect as well. So how can we utilise the thermal storage within our buildings, um, but then also on-site energy storage? And I'll touch on this in a bit, because the, the key trick here and the biggest challenge from an implementation perspective is the integration of all these different assets. So you can, you can build these things individually um, and you can inch your way towards net zero, but as you start to scale up, how do you integrate all these different assets so you can reduce the costs and the time to get to net zero as well, which is where, where the challenge lies. And I think where um, our next part of this journey is gonna be really interesting to see. So I'll run through some updates on our performance and, and what we've done to date. Um, so from an energy efficiency point of view and um, big shout out to Kendra on this front, she's really driven, driven this program. Um, also driven a lot of the graphics, which you'll see today. So thank you, Kendra. Um, so from an energy intensity point of view, we've managed to reduce our energy intensity by 24% um, from 2015 through to 2020. And that's through a mix of building optimization programs. So this is tuning buildings to make sure they're running um, as efficiently as they possibly can. And then also a really large scale um, LED retrofit program. Um, lighting, lighting consumes um, a, a significant portion of our, our energy consumption. So, so this program's rolled out across our campuses um, to replace LED lighting as well. So the benefits of this, obviously, in terms of um, cost savings are significant, but also in terms of a scalable program, um, these are commercially feasible technologies today um, and will deliver immediate payback from an energy point of view, but then also from a maintenance point of view as well. Um, from an energy intensity perspective, the reason we use this metric, you'll see that graph there, that our total energy use um, hasn't, hasn't declined massively over time. That's because we've grown significantly as an, as an institution. So uh, the university's footprint has been growing, but we've managed to reduce the energy consumed per square metre down as well. Um, there's been a big focus on making sure our new builds um, are built to a high performing standard as well. Um, so my colleague Rob Grimblecombe and Kendra have worked very hard um, focusing on a passive house standard approach for our new builds. And it's been great to see um, the building up there in the background is um, Gillies Hall at our Peninsula campus, um, which is a passive house certified student accommodation building. So it's over 100, 100 beds. Um, and it was actually the first building of its type certified to passive house standards in Australia as well. So it's got a high performing thermal envelope on it um, and really high performance in terms of energy efficiency. Compared to a similar building um, on our Clayton campus, which was built recently, um, it operates at about a third of the energy consumed um, on a per square metre basis as well. Um, it's, it's a bit less dense than that building, so it runs at about 50% less energy um, per bed um, than that. It's also got high performance in terms of um, indoor air quality as well, which is another one of the co-benefits um, that we get from pushing along these standards. 
We've also been pushing to make sure any new builds are all electric, um, just to make sure they're ready for that transition once we get to 100% renewables. And we've managed to certify um, one of our most recent buildings, um, which is more of a teaching and learning building, a commercial office space, if you like, um, to Passive House Standard as well, which is the largest building of its type in Australia to meet that standard. In the bottom right, you'll see our new Chancery building, um, which was designed with Passive House principles uh, in mind. And again, it's another high performing all electric building, um, solar built in as well. In terms of our on-site renewables program, again, another fantastic program that's been able to scale with this commercially viable solution as well. So we've deployed um, four megawatts of solar PV across our campuses to date. Um, the largest system we've got in place is a 740 kilowatt system uh, on top of a car park. So it's actually roofing cover um, for, for a car park. And we're just about to expand this again with the same working with um, Anna's team at Engie as part of, part of the partnership we've got in place. Um, I guess one of our challenges is having um, available roof and land space um, for solar uh, on site as well. So the generation that you see there probably covers somewhere from 8 to 10% of our annual electricity consumption, and we just do not have enough room on site to shift to 100% on site renewable generation behind the meter. So that's where our off site um, program comes in place. And again, big, big shout out to Kendra for, for driving this program. Um, we've signed a power purchase agreement with the Murrawarra Wind Farm, which is located in Horsham in regional Victoria, a significant distance from our campuses. Um, this is a financial instrument where we surrender the renewable energy certificates which are generated and um, put the electricity back into the main electricity grid. At the moment, um, we're surrendering enough to get us to a 50% um, of our electricity, our consumed electricity from renewable sources. You'll see that graph in the bottom right. Um, ultimately, once we shift ourselves away from gas, um, we've got enough capacity in this PPA to cover 100% of our load, which we'll um, ultimately get to. Um, at the latest, it'll be by 2030, and we'll probably look to bring that forward as we go, as we're trying to increase ambition in this space as well. Um, in terms of the electric electrification space, so for those new builds, we're making sure they're all electric and then we have to work back in to work ourselves off natural gas. Um, we have a high pressure, um, high pressure steam hot water loop, um, which runs around the campus, which is uh, very inefficient and also runs off gas boilers. And so we've been taking a, um, a precinct based approach where we're trying to cut across a number of buildings to electric plant. Um, we've been working on a concept study with NG looking at district heating and cooling for our Clayton campus, um, which we think is going to be the most um, efficient and cost effective approach to help us switch away uh, from natural gas. And from a net zero perspective, at a city perspective, this is the highest capital cost piece of work, but also the hardest one, as Anna touched on, in terms of um, the challenges of retrofitting a city as you go. So um, this is where having a, a partner such as NG really helps us to be able to, to address a large challenge over time too, because this, this is a large chunk of the financial commitment we've needed to make. We'll, we'll go into this program, but also um, it's going to take the largest amount of time. We'll need the longest lead time to get there as well. Um, on, the, on the microgrid front, um, I guess what we've been looking at is how do we get control over our assets, both our buildings as well as our uh, distributed energy resources, so those solar systems, the EV charges, um, our storage, and how do we orchestrate those to integrate as much renewables as we can um, into our local grid, um, but then also support the broader network and realise new revenue streams as well. So we've received some funding through um, the Australian Renewable Energy Agency and also the Victorian government and have partnered with Indra to develop um, a microgrid pilot at our Clayton campus. There's a lot more information on this, um, on, on that website there listed, which we can post into the chat afterwards. Um, but really this is helping us optimize our own energy use and reduce our own um, energy costs, but also um, to access some new revenue streams as well. We're also working a lot in the space of um, digital buildings where we're really trying to bring these buildings online so they can respond to some of these grid signals, but also using artificial intelligence to, to tune them and operate. 
Um, we've also got some battery storage systems installed as well, which feed into this. Um, I won't I won't too, touch too much on the financial side of things, um, as I've sort of focused on the technology side of things. But obviously, financing is one of the the key challenges in terms of getting these systems up and running. Um, and we've managed to raise uh, climate bonds to to help cover our costs. So just to wrap up from my end, I guess where to where to from here, and where do we see as some of the next challenges? So. As I touched on, electrification is a big challenge and it's going to occupy us as we, as we work to shift away from natural gas. Um, we're looking at a, a net zero strategy for transportation for our staff and students who utilise our cities. Um, this is by far our biggest source of emissions, even bigger than our um, emissions from our buildings. And likewise, the emissions from our supply chain um, are quite large as well. And so we've got to start to work to address those. And we're also starting to look at how can we move away from financial instruments for PPAs to shift ourselves towards workforce and renewables. How can we do this for ourselves, but then how can we also uh, help our community? And I'll finish there. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. That was great. Um, so keeping things moving straight along, I will introduce our next speaker, uh, Rajan Rawal. Um, so Rajan is actually an architect and he's currently a senior advisor at the Center for Advanced Research in Building Science and Energy, which is called Carsby, uh, and a CRDF professor at CEPT University, which is where he's in um, India. Uh, previously, he was the executive director of Carsby, so between 2006 and 2021. Uh, and he worked with the Vatsu Shipa Foundation for Studies and Research in Environmental Design before uh, joining the Faculty of Design where he currently is at the university. Um, he taught design and construction courses as part of the undergraduate program and he teaches energy efficiency, um, built environment, energy policy, energy modeling and simulations at the postgraduate level. Um, his work, uh, sorry, the emphasis of his work is on energy performance of buildings and cities. Um, and architectural science education. He's a member of various technical core committees of the Bureau of Energy Efficiency, the Ministry of Power, uh, Naiti Ayong, National Building, the Green Building Council, the Green Building Certificate, Certification Institute, and the Indian Green Building Council. Um, he also represents India at the International Energy Agency um, at the EBC Annex 69 on low energy buildings and thermal comfort. Um, Mission Innovation Challenge 7 on affordable housing, heating and cooling, um, and also the Global Building Performance Network. He's an organizing council member of the Global Cooling Prize, um, and he's a founder member, he's the founder member, secretary of the Indian chapter of the International Building Performance Simulation Association, and serves um, at IPSPA World as chair education. He also serves on the Executive Council of Alliance for Energy Efficient um, economy, the Research Advisory Board of Development Alternatives, and the Editorial Board of the Journal of Buildings and Cities. Um, he has several research publications and projects to his credit and has been honored with fellow status both by ASHRAE, which is the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, Air Conditioning Engineers, and by the International Building Performance Simulation Association. Um, and he's also the first Indian architect to receive um, that second honor. Um, and he was also recognized by ASHRAE as a distinguished lecturer in 2021. So we are very lucky to have Ajahn with us today um, to talk about his work in um, data. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Kendra. Uh, thanks for a very generous introduction. Uh, and let me, let me begin uh, my presentation on this net zero uh, cities of the future with um, with a quote which uh, says a lot about how are we really, really shaping our present. And it's by a German philosopher which says that the future influences the past, uh, it influences the present as much as the past. That means how do we want to see our future? Uh, and that is the way probably we need to start constructing how are we living in the, in the present and what kind of practices which we are uh, putting it together, uh, which will obviously influence the future. Uh, the, the painting which you see uh, on the screen is called a miniature painting in Indian, um, uh, Indian painting style, which actually demonstrates the typical 
uh, medieval city of Jaipur and how the newer urban scape is also taking place at the in, in the same precincts of old. So that basically helps us to understand where we are, uh, what was our past and where we want to move forward. Uh, with that, um, let me give you a little bit of background about what's a kind of work which generally happens in the various uh, various nations and India is no different from uh, those contexts as far as the building energy efficiency and uh, zero uh, uh, net zero cities are concerned. Uh, there are several documents prepared at the national level. And in India, we have very ambitious and very futuristic uh, document called India Cooling Action Plan. Uh, Indian government did recognize that, uh, that we will require a huge amount of cooling to keep people comfortable, thermally comfortable in their cities, uh, in their buildings. At the same time, we do not need to sort of impact the environment negatively while we start cooling people. Uh, uh, for, for just an example that in India, room air conditioner cooling penetration is less than probably about 8% uh, as compared to many other similar countries, uh, even like a Pakistan or uh, Sri Lanka or Bangladesh, uh, where uh, cooling has become a need uh, to, to keep the health and to keep the productivity on. We have seen how uh, Singapore has adopted air conditioning. So looking at these various contexts, Indian government decide to put a document together which talks about near term uh, aims that how do we really make sure that people are comfortable, they, are, they remain healthy at the same time, we don't really use a huge amount of energy uh, which will be required for cooling. Another anecdote information is that amount of cooling would be required by 2050 in India is equivalent to amount of total energy which we are generating right now in the country. So that means that more buildings are going to come up, more and more air condition space would be required to, to carry out the economic activities. Uh, the document does provide good amount of guidance that how do we really save energy in the, in, in the buildings and also in various other, uh, uh, various other domains such as cold chain and so on and so forth. Uh, having that, we do have a documents which help us govern the energy conservation in the building or energy, energy efficiency in the buildings, which we call it a building codes. Uh, they have a prescription uh, regarding how to construct a building, what should be the thermal performance of the building, what should be the thermal uh, uh, energy performance of the HVAC systems or lighting systems. Uh, and they provide us a certain amount of benchmark. They provide certain amount of target for new commercial buildings as well as residential building, which India is building up. Uh, these codes are very much into the, um, into the practice, they are getting implemented at the city level through a legislation change at the state level. Uh, but basically these, these document comes from the, uh, the national government and gets percolated down to the state and at the city level. And at the micro scale, we do have various kind of guidelines which actually help what you see here is one of the output where you actually can see how do you really design a, uh, a system of the building so that you don't use more energy to keep people comfortable inside. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, people can create a, or rather can engage themselves into the economic activity. So there are a lot of micro level design guides are also uh, available for tropical countries, for countries like India to design commercial buildings or residential buildings. And recently, there's quite a bit of uh, effort going on to make sure that within the even industrial buildings or manufacturing plants, uh, the workers are getting a, a reasonable amount of comfort. So at the micro scale, at the meso scale, at the same time we have a, at the micro scale, we do have a certain kind of guidance. We do have certain kind of codes or standards, uh, which helps us to uh, uh, move towards the net zero uh, cities. Uh, India did launch a very ambitious plan uh, for smart cities, about 100 smart cities uh, uh, were, or rather cities were recognized, about 100 cities were recognized and they 
We are given a funding to move towards the net zero target or smart city target uh, by, by 2022, uh, when India is going to become a 75 year old after the independence. So there's quite a bit of moment, uh, momentum going on at the national level, at the academia level and at the industry level as well. And all of these are leading towards a sort of uh, net zero uh, cities in India. However, the path is pretty long, very complex and um, uh, difficult to achieve, but at least there are certain kind of positive uh, trends which we are seeing in India. Let me give you a little bit of background about how do we really do this. Uh, a little bit of technical slide. What you see on a uh, x-axis of this is uh, uh, the scale, which is buildings, communities, and cities. And on y-axis, uh, you do see a kind of methods or kind of approaches which we can adopt to design and later on operate net zero cities. So if we go a little bit more into the details uh, at the building energy efficiency level, we do have a physics-based model. Uh, they, they account what is the kind of climate under which building is going to perform, uh, what would their occupancy, what would be the, the nature of the activities inside. And based on that, uh, one can design a building, looking at the building physics, looking at the various aspects of HVAC systems and so on and so forth. And uh, when you increase the scale, that similar kind of approach also can help us um, manage some, sometimes the climate induced disaster uh, as well, where you're looking at the uh, supply of or an un unavailability of electricity and how do we really rely on uh, simple uh, solar photovoltaics or simply battery storage to make sure that building still performs at the minimum level. And then same kind of approach also uh, uh, can be applied or can be studied at the urban scale, at the urban heat island, the anthropogenic heat, which gets generated uh, in, the, in the city and which primarily have a bearing on amount of energy which we use inside the building. So it's a, it's a cyclic affair that uh, heat rejection from HVAC systems will remain in the, uh, in the micro environment and hence HVAC system needs to overwork or work harder to provide a cooling inside and by virtue of that, their efficiency goes down and hence we use more and more energy and so on and so forth. So that's the one approach uh, that's a kind uh, the the first principle approach by which we try to understand the building level at the community level at the city level that how do we really operate our buildings how do we design our buildings which can probably in the future can be uh, can be supplemented with uh, renewable energy and can achieve a net zero uh, status but at the same time when we start looking at the community level we, when you start looking at occupant centric modeling approach uh, we need to rely a little bit more on a data-driven models, uh, leaving or rather balancing between a physics-based model and data-driven uh, model where occupants are at the center of the, uh, the whole, whole game and trying to understand what are the habits they have, what are the requirements they have uh, for, for to, to keep them com comfortable. Or uh, So basically, the, the building controls, the occupant-centric modeling, also, uh, intermittent power supply through the renewables uh, is the place where we start looking at the data-driven models. And all these, once we start putting together, as you can see on the right-hand side top, is where probably it can lead to a net, city, uh, net zero cities. So to achieve net zero uh, 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 cities, we can't rely on one type of model or we can't rely on one type of method. The message here is that we need to understand quite a few things. Uh, it's not just about energy, but it's about water. Whenever we supply water to the city, we do use energy. So water energy nexus, in fact, when we start looking at a food production within the city or immediate surroundings of the city, we also need to look at the water energy there. So it's basically a water energy food nexus also needs to be understood. And again, the climate uh, variability, extreme climate events, and how these things will get affected because of that. So basically, a climate science and climate modeling also gets into the picture. Uh, looking at these things at the city of Ahmedabad, which is about 23 degrees north, which is on a, in a tropic, uh, tropical climate, the, 
highest temperature goes to about 45 degree, 46 degree. And recent days, recent time, we have also started looking at more and more heat waves where it, not just a dry bulb temperature, but also wet bulb temperature goes up. That means that uh, no, the, the traditional way of keeping a body cool no longer works. So for example, people working in the, on the construction sites, on the, on the, on the certain uh, areas, uh, consumption of uh, water or consumption of buttermilk no longer provides them uh, enough uh, comfort, primarily because the wet bulb temperature, primarily because the relative humidity outside the, in, in the outside air remains high and hence, hence the heat dissipation from the body becomes very, very uh, difficult. So looking at some of those uh, aspects, how do we really design a cities where it is not that everybody is inside the inside the building, but also there are enough opportunities where people can spend a, a reasonable amount of time outside the city and how do we really design a city. So trying to look at some of those uh, perspective uh, and trying to bring the top down approach, which is primarily based on a statistical or economic models and trying to look at the first principle approach, which is from the bottom up, trying to look at the physiology of the people, trying to look at the, the uh, physics of the buildings. How do we make sure that our uh, cities move towards net zero? And what are the ingredients to achieve that net zero cities is the work which we are doing in the city of Ahmedabad. Uh, it also ranges from a town planning schemes to a local uh, local area planning, or we call it LAP. Or recently, we have also started looking at uh, transport-oriented development. That means wherever you have a transport corridors, probably you would like to have a higher amount of floor space available uh, so that you can move people uh, easily and at the same time can contain the city in a reasonable amount of geographical location and not really go for uh, widespread horizontal development. And that's where we also try to look at the rejuvenation of the old uh, land, old uh, uh, um, some of the bio, uh, some of the laws which we have uh, since since about fifty years trying to look at them again. How do we really even use the land as a resource more effectively, more efficiently? Uh, so that's one area where the city scale modeling needs to understand what are the present uh, uh, in, uh, present uh, uh, inputs which we are using for town planning schemes. Another uh, in, important part is about the municipal services and administrative use of administrative data. Uh, typically in India, as well as in a large part of the world, EUI or EPI is a way to understand performance of the building. That means uh, either energy use index EUI or energy performance index EPI, which basically suggests that how much energy one is using per square meter over a year. Now that, that needs to probably relooked at again, because it might be the case that I have a net zero building in a, in a, in a remote area of the city or out, just outside the city. And hence the city is probably using a lot of uh, uh, energy to supply water or to remove the waste from that particular uh, group of buildings or in a community. Uh, or you have a very, very inefficient uh, building in the center of the city and a municipal corporation do not use, do not need to use more amount of energy to supply water and so on and so forth. So what we are trying to do is that something which is above the ground, something which is below the ground, and how do we really put these things together to un understand actual performance of the building? Uh, can we really expand the definition of EUI or EPI? And we start including uh, municipal services or amount of energy gets used per square meter of a floor space, wherever your building is as a part of your EUI calculation or EPI calculations. And that's where uh, the, the energy code help us to meet some of, the, uh, some of these objectives. The present code does have a futuristic scenarios inbuilt in that, that, okay, we are looking at 2021 codes, but we will be looking at certain kind of stringency in 2025. Uh, we will make it more stringent in 2030 and all that is getting documented right away so that industry so that in architectural practices also remains informed about 
the how buildings are to be designed five years down the line or seven or 10 years down the line. Uh, this is in a context where India is yet to build uh, quite a few buildings and we don't have a building stock which we can uh, uh, which is required to conduct certain amount of uh, economic activities uh, housing is uh, housing crunch is a huge problem a lot of people need to be housed in a in a more formal and uh, 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 comfortable houses or structurally stable houses uh, hence this, this all suggests that india is going to build um, more buildings in next uh, 20 30 years so what do we do and uh, how do we really start looking at the city uh, and the biggest question comes in is that do we really have a data by which we can handle uh, this kind of complexity uh, there are various sources uh, one can rely on whether it is administrative data available with the government or a local body, or there are certain kind of, even within that you have a plan, town planning scheme department, you have administrative data or property tax data department, or you have a transport department and everyone will have different kind of uh, uh, types of data and a kind of data. And to put all those things together would be sort of nightmare. So one of the technology which uh, one can use is uh, three-dimensional uh, models or generating dynamic three-dimensional models through either a, a LIDAR or photogrammetry uh, modeling techniques uh, using drones across the city and trying to create a three-dimensional uh, 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 nature of the city, which is basically we're talking about digi digital twin of at the city level. And the city is basically, uh, Ahmedabad has about uh, 498 square kilometer uh, and uh, approximately about uh, 0 0.6 to 0 0.65 million uh, buildings and more properties within that as well. So how do we really capture the thermal characteristics of these buildings? Not that all buildings would be a naturally ventilated building, not that all buildings would be air conditioned building, there would be mixed mode building. That means one building, a part of that would be air conditioned, part of that would be uh, uh, naturally ventilated or naturally ventilated part would be used as air conditioned during the high summer time. So how do we really capture uh, these kind of dynamics? And for that, as I mentioned, we use uh, some of the photogrammetry and LIDAR modeling. Then we use what you see here is on the left hand side top is the raw data. And then that gets analyzed through uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence, trying to understand, trying to differentiate what are the trees, what are the buildings, and then sometimes roadside uh, temples or cars or lorries also gets picked up as an entity as a building because they are they're, they're sizable in in the uh, in in their size or sometimes our buildings are also so tiny that they do get captured as a so there are certain kind of uh, intelligence needs to be built in the model and then finally what you see on the right hand side is uh, we get a three-dimensional nature of the city. Uh, this is only one layer. One can figure it out. How many windows do they have? Uh, what is a uh, kind of status of air conditioning use these buildings will have? And that helps us to understand at least one part of the story, which is energy consumed in a city. But then uh, the, uh, what we do is that we, we superimpose administrative data, we track, the municipal services through SCADA system, uh, trying to understand how much water supply is going in that area or in that particular municipal ward, how the so solid waste disposal is taking place, how much amount of solid waste is getting displaced from those localities through, uh, uh, through municipal services and how many tons are getting disposed and also trying to understand uh, what is sort of uh, environmental impact of that. So basically trying to look at the, uh, the municipal services and private property together, trying to understand how the dynamics of the energy dynamics of the inner environment works in the city. And that's where the water and energy uh, uh, value chain, we are, we are trying to understand how do we really integrate that? Is there any uh, uh, chance of optimizing the operation of the city? Uh, just to give you another anecdote that 65 to 75% of the uh, revenue of the city gets used in uh, electricity bills. Uh, primarily amount of water they 
dispose or what are they mobilize or amount of sewage they they discharge into the uh, sewage treatment plants a huge amount of electricity gets used by municipal corporation by local bodies so we are trying to optimize and that optimization also help us to understand how the how the city should grow in the future and then finally when we start looking at this we also try to look at the renewable energy potential whether it is through the solar rooftops or integration of these with the uh, existing grid and how do we really make sure that in future also we we work with the city which is more harmonious in terms of energy supply and energy demand while we do that we are also working uh, with the quite a few uh, organizations to understand how do we really operate the buildings in a mixed mode operation that sometimes you operate a building in a uh, uh, air conditioned mode but wherever outside is favorable you try to understand uh, you try to operate that in a, a, a naturally ventilated mode and then also use of personal thermal comfort systems thermal person control systems that you really don't need to cool entire building you just cool a place around you wherever you are working and try to make yourself comfortable and not try to waste energy by cooling the entire building so those are the sort of uh, ingredients of uh, buildings where we try to achieve net zero and with that probably i would like to uh, stop my um, um, talk here and would like to wish you very happy diwali today thank you great thank you so much for that Roger. um so last but of course not least sure. Um, we have Brian Balanson um, to speak to us, um, and Ryan is an action-oriented urban researcher whose work intersects cities, climate change, community engagement, and governance innovation. Um, he's also interested in how participative research approaches can advance theoretical understanding and achieve practical impact and help create more just cities. Um, he's worked at the crossroads of research and policy in multiple contexts. In 2014, he had a policy fellowship in the US with the governor of Oregon's Natural Resource Policy Office. And during his graduate studies, he led a research project exploring the mechanisms sustainable city, sustainable city networks use to facilitate governance innovations within their member cities. So the work particularly explored the policy and governance um, changes in Rotterdam, the Netherlands, Berkeley, in the USA and facilitated by the city's membership in the 100 Resilient Cities Network, supported by the Rockefeller Foundation. So over to you, Ryan. Hi, everyone. Um, good morning, good evening. Um, it's a real pleasure to be with you today. I'm going to try to go over my slides as quickly as possible because I know you all have asked questions in the chat, and, and I think all of us would, would like to engage in a discussion around those. Um, so you've heard a lot from my colleagues earlier on the call about the sort of technical aspects of creating net zero cities. Um, but what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about the, the human side of this, the, the governance side of, of what, what it actually means to, to plan, to design, um, and deliver a net zero city from the perspective of the individuals living in, in a city. Um, whoops. So um, you all you all know about the, the kind of urgency of climate change. I'm not going to get into the statistics or any, any of that related to, to climate change. But just to frame climate change as a, as a super wicked, urgent challenge, um, you'll, you'll likely have heard um, Greta Thunberg's message to leaders at, at Davos in 2019, where she said in front of prime ministers, presidents, and, and the elite that, that come to Davos, um, that I want you to act as if you are in emergency. I want you to act as if you are in a crisis. Our house is on fire. Um, Michael Mann, a, a, um, a climate scientist in the US at, um, at, at Penn University, um, he said a few weeks ago that we have a shrinking window of a reigning opportunity to prevent truly catastrophic climate change only if we act boldly now. If we fail to act, we will leave behind a fundamentally degraded planet for our children. Mm -hmm. So this is a problem of extreme urgency. Um, but for cities, this is a real challenge because of the complexities that exist within them. Um, cities are concentrated spaces globally of integrated economic activity, but also social infrastructures. And this is, this is a really key point. Um, in, in terms of 
uh, enacting a lot of the changes that um, you, he you heard about earlier, that the kind of smart city changes, the technical changes to the way we build buildings, the technical changes to the way we power those buildings. This is a technical problem, but it's also a social problem. Um, this will affect the way that we heat our homes, live in our homes, use our homes, as well as the places of work and leisure um, and, and everything else that goes along with, with life in a city, the way that we access food and produce food, the way that we travel from place to place, um, what we decide to do for leisure. Um, all of our activities are impacted by, by our, all of our, excuse me, all of our activities help fuel climate change. They can also ameliorate it and these technological solutions that are in place. Um, they need to be integrated with the way people live their lives, that these won't just come easily. Um, and that's what I'd like to talk about a little bit here. Thinking about the impact on our everyday social infrastructures, as a colleague of mine, um, Dan Hill, talks about. Um, there's, there's a real pressure that a large swath of society is beginning to really cope with and recognize. So these photos are of Extinction Rebellion protests that happened in London, but also globally. Same thing, the, the photo below of the Fridays for the Future, which is a, a youth movement, recognizing the urgency of climate change and, and need to take swift action at scale immediately. Um, and that's critical. And these voices have, have made a huge difference in the last few years. But this is juxtaposed against the individuals that, that will be impacted negatively, depending on how these changes take place. So the photo on top comes from um, a protest that happened in London of taxi drivers um, because of congestion charge that was due to come into place within the city to help limit um, uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions from, from cars and also improve air quality. But this would really negatively impact taxi drivers who are living at the margins already economically within the city. The photo below that is, is of the yellow vest protests that happened in, in, in France and, and really concentrated within cities. Paris, Lyon, uh, Marseille were real epicenters of the same thing. Um, it was a fuel tax surcharge that, that was being placed on, on all vehicles and it was really heavily impacting taxis and lorry drivers. Again, living at the margins economically. So these small shifts that are intended to, to make a positive impact within the city um, would negatively harm certain groups unintentionally. So there's a real need to think about how we recognize and cope with the urgency of climate change and those voices that, that are making urgent pleas as they should with the individuals that, that will be impacted and making small changes to them um, is a real challenge. So this comes to an example I'm going to speak with you about for the remainder of, of my presentation. Um, in, in Greater Manchester, where they've tried to take an approach called co-production. So they've tried to recognize that there are different forms of knowing and knowledge. And what co-production is, is all about is a cooperative ethos and set of practices. It's not a single method. Co-production is a, con a concept which is rooted in civic participation that seeks to develop spaces for learning and cross-institutional reflection between society, policy, business, academia, community organizations, all aligned with the spirit of supporting sustainable urban transformation. There's a number of different forms of co-production. What I'm going to talk to you about today is policy co-production. And what this looks at is how you can bring together the different, the different actors, the different stakeholders that exist within a city, getting them into a room together to work cooperatively. So this is going to be a whistle stop tour of, of a process that, that took place in Greater Manchester. Um, so for those of you that don't know, Greater Manchester is a city in the northwest of England. Um, there's a, a, a heated competition between Manchester and Liverpool around who is the real birthplace, the epicenter of the Industrial Revolution. Um, and, and Greater Manchester really has a, a pioneering identity within the, the local community. It sees itself as a leader from the Industrial Revolution to progressive politics around um, worker rights. It's the birthplace of unions, um, also class struggle and, and culture. Um, but in 2012, this, this map that you can see um, of Greater Manchester, a city region, elected a, a metro mayor. Um, and that metro mayor, Andy Burnham, was elected in 2017 
and in his manifesto promised to accelerate the city region's carbon neutrality ambitions, which he proclaimed would be led by experts, but crucially city stakeholders in a public debate to determine a new goal, which would be announced at what he called the Green Summit. So there was a big process that took place, and I'm going to talk to you about the kind of four different pathways that co-production um, manifested in this given process. So there was one around what was called the Green Summit Steering Group, this, this collection of individuals representing universities, large employers, large manufacturers, different community-based organizations, um, but also uh, key minority groups that are also not typically engaged in climate politics locally. Then there were listening events. So there's a number of photos you can see here. This photo, this photo, this photo, and this photo, all are of listening events, which engaged different stakeholder groups in, in the, the city region. There were 42 of these in total that engaged over uh, 1,400 individuals. And they, they got into the nitty gritty, looking at if we're going to make these huge changes within the way we live our lives, looking at the sorts of buildings you just heard about from Rajan, how can these buildings improve the way that, that we live? How can alternative models of, of energy enable residents to, to, to use electricity more efficiently so they're able to, to take that money that they're saving to, to use for other things? How, as um, Anna talked about, switching from internal combustion, charge, uh, internal combustion engine vehicles to electric, what does that actually look like from the perspective of an individual? How can we move them from a car into public transit? How, how do you make essentially the green option the best option? Because it's the best, not because it's green. That's what these listening events were all about. And then there were two green summits. There's, there's a photo of, of, of green summit workshop here, another green summit here, um, and then thematic expert groups. Um, so these were groups of um, expert practitioners that looked at what came out of those listening events and, and using their technical knowledge to distill what that would look like um, into a policy roadmap. So this first uh, roadmap was called the Springboard Report, which essentially distilled everything that came out of those listening events and an initial Green Summit, which took place in 2019. And at this point, there wasn't enough consensus to move forward and say, we, we know what to do moving forward. This is a, a policy we can put in place. It was a moment in time in capturing that. Um, and there was a commitment within this springboard report to produce an additional um, plan five year, or excuse me, one year later, um, which was the five-year environment plan. And this is the, the pathway that Greater Manchester has taken to become carbon neutral by 2038. This was a plan adopted before the climate emergency wave that, that swept cities um, um, recently. Um, and it's a big achievement, this plan, what, what went into it, all of the ideas from lots of city stakeholders. Um, just a, ending with a short quote from the mayor on co-production, um, who he recognized the importance of really listening to the ideas, stories, and priorities of residents within the city region and using that to shape action. And also recognizing climate change will only be solved by taking a human-centric approach, using the ideas of residents to inform policy. So for, for, for co-production and, and co-producing climate action, there are a few um, uh, there, there are a few interesting lessons that, that come out from this story. One is around the need for organizational commitment and embedding an, uh, an, an, a culture of co-production within the organizations convening these processes. Co-production is something that can only be realized um, if local authorities recognize that there are different forms of knowing and knowledge um, beyond that of just the normal actors they engage with. And this really takes a commitment to, to, to co-production. Um, there's also a need to develop non-traditional distribution of power. Um, so typically in a policy design process, it's the local authority, the local officers that are, that are writing the, the policies, writing the plans, um, and the other stakeholders are on the margins are left with soft forms of power, which can be fuzzy and amorphous. But for co-production, there has to be new articulations of power, bringing together um, both formal and informal. Um, and finally, co-production is a slow, messy process, which goes back to the challenge of urgency. Co-production is something that takes a lot of time to build trust and respect between different actors that are involved in these processes. And you don't necessarily know what's going to come out. This process initially was designed to take a year, but it ended up taking over two years. 
I would argue that that led to a more robust outcome. But because of the urgency, this is a real challenge. And, and because this is a shared process, um, outcomes can't be deterministic. Um, so I'll, I'll leave you there. Um, and I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all today. And, and I hope that we all together are able to, to really make net zero cities of the future because it will take all of us. Okay, thank you. Back to you, Kendra. Thank you, Ryan. Um, so we have a bit four minutes left. Um, a lot of the questions, thank you for them in the chat in the question and answer box have been being answered as we go along. Um, but I suppose just for myself watching the questions come through, one that, uh, or I guess a common theme that I've seen come through is the question of waste, um, particularly as we build new buildings, as we demolish buildings, um, waste that's coming out of buildings and the, I guess, how does that fit into net zero cities? Um, so should I maybe go around the Zoom and see if everyone wants to have a little chat around waste? So I'll start with you, Anna, your thoughts around, um, are we doing, are we making things worse by building, building new and um, building new net zero cities? I think, um, yeah, it, it's, it's uh, the eternal question and, and a really interesting question, Kendra. And I think part of what we need to do when we, when we describe building new cities um, is that I think we need to utilize as much of the existing infrastructure as we have available. It does require us to build some new stuff, um, but I don't think necessarily we need to knock down all of our old buildings um, and, and build completely new ones. I think, I think it is really important to be mindful of that, um, of that waste um, uh, situation and, and, and noting that, you know, as we do construct uh, and new, new materials to construct new infrastructure, um, that there is a lot of research going on um, into, into how we, um, how do we um, create green steel, for example, which is obviously a common um, <laughs> infrastructure material. Um, you know, how do how do we start um, using materials that are um, that are green in the in themselves? And I think that is a question that we can't answer um, fully today. Um, but we know that there is you know significant research and work going on in in those areas. And equally, then. Um, with the infrastructure that we do build. And if we think about things like solar panels and batteries, um, how do we work to ensure that when they reach end of life, um, that we've got a mechanism to recycle uh, those products as well. And I know that there's uh, a definitely, um, again, um, an enormous amount of um, investment that's being made into developing technologies to, to answer those questions. Great, thank you. Um, Rajan, I'm just thinking in um, your context of the, the data you're collecting and understanding around improving the building's performance, I guess, do you have any thoughts around materials, waste, and that impact on net zero cities? That's true. So I think one of the question was that, how do we really need to make uh, new buildings or new cities? And at least in context of a developing economies like India, uh, let me give you a number that uh, as per a national building code, we need about a 45 square meter uh, of, a, of a residential space for one family of four. Uh, in an average in, in, the, in the country, we have about 21 square meter. That means, uh, so I'm, I'm talking about 210 square foot or 450 square foot. So there is a, there is a gap which needs to be bridged. That means there are there has to be some more building construction needs to happen. However, the uh, construction, new construction and material, we always give this lock-in period kind of uh, argument that if you don't uh, construct with the appropriate material, which can help you uh, construct in a comfortable manner, uh, that means you will be get locked at 70, 70 years and you will not have a chance to uh, change the building you may have a chance to change your light bulb or a ceiling fan or uh, air conditioner in five, seven years. But if you do wrong things at the building, we get locked in for 70, 80 years. And hence it makes sense to uh, build a building which is comfortable. Uh, that also reduces the cost on or operational cost on uh, poor people or those who do, cannot afford electricity. Uh, but the challenge is such a wide that we need to construct fast we need to construct affordably, but at the same time, we need to construct something which provides a comfort. And that's where the intersection we are right now dealing with. 
Thank you. Thank you. Right, I'm gonna throw one question to Ryan. Oh, Scott, you're gonna get off scot free. Um, so it was a question actually that came out of Anna's presentation about um, questioning um, the plan to phase out fossil fuel in the system was sort of missing from our diagram, but um, Scott then did talk about how we've got a commitment to phase out natural gas. From your perspective of engaging with the community, I guess, how would you engage with the community around that idea of phasing out fossil fuel or going all electric? Yeah, so it's a it's a huge topic and, and something that um, I, th I think mer merits a bigger discussion. So so I'll, I'll kind of keep everything I say um, simplified and, and knowing that, that it's overly simplified. This, this is a challenge in, in the UK, for example, that's, that's mainly controlled at national level. Every country has, has a different way of uh, generating and distributing power, but phasing out um, fossil fuels in the UK is, is something that, that's determined by the national grid, which is a, a nationally regulated organization. So for cities, it, it's about how do they engage with, with the different flows of, of electricity? Um, how do they engage with the national grid around that? For, so fossil fuels are, are great because they're easy um, to turn on and off essentially where with renewables that the, the supply um, is is harder to regulate um, and th this trickles down to to, to residents um, to, to understand with residents when are they using electricity and are they able to change their patterns of when they use electricity based upon when it's available um, so it, it's something controlled at a very high level but it has impacts on the ground um, and this also then has impacts for the sorts of cost. So in the UK, um, fuel poverty, people not being able to afford um, uh, natural gas now, but it, it, it will be electricity as more and more homes become electrified for their heating, aren't able to afford energy to heat their homes because in the UK, we have very uh, leaky buildings. Um, they're not very energy efficient. So this is another issue. If we're able to reduce the cost of electricity so people can heat these leaky homes, um, is it necessarily a good thing if, if they're using more and more electricity, if it's renewable, um, or, or do we need to switch to, um, to, to as Rajan um, eloquently spoke about, the, the, the real building construction to make homes more efficient so that they're using less electricity to begin with in the first place. So the, the issues are, are, are really complex, which require bringing together local, national, um, and, and, and super local the, the kind of neighborhood level to understand the linkages and complexities between something like an energy system to understand how you transition from from coal to renewable sources and, and that also I didn't speak about leaves out the whole worker side of this the just transition aspect the need to engage workers that are involved in this system so it's a hugely complex challenge. Great. Thanks for summing it up in a few minutes. Um, so it is just past whatever time it is in your time zone. It's just three minutes past the end of this session. <laughs> so it's just past 9.30 p.m. here in um, Melbourne. So first, I wanted to thank very much Ryan, Anna, Rajan and Scott for their presentations and sharing their knowledge today. Um, the recording will be available on the website for the conference after, and I believe presentations are also available. Um, and I'm sure all of the speakers would be happy if you wanted to reach out to them via LinkedIn. Have you had any further questions for them? And we will finish it there. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Kendra. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.